Welcome to the Total Connector Show. My name is Kay Vandavani. My very, very special guest is Eric Kaysen from the States. Eric, thank you so much for your time and uh, for coming to my show for the for first time. And thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, how are you, man? Uh, <laughs> Doing great. We're, we're in sunny California. Uh, unfortunately, we have high winds, so half the state decided to shut off power, but thankfully I'm in a pocket without it. But uh, yeah, otherwise, I've been having a great time. And, and how are you? Yeah, I'm great. I mean, I'm just a little bit uh, exhausted, you know, from this weather. It's raining and it's cold again, you know, in Austria. I just wish I could just teleport myself somewhere else. But <laughs> this is just, you know, a little bit depressing, the whole weather. Um, Eric, I've been reading your uh, articles, not all of them, a couple of them. You, I mean, maybe I can. Yeah, just... I've, I have kind of a prolific amount of work out there, so. Yeah, uh, but it's really deep down the rabbit hole. Um, let me see, where are you? Over here, just for the YouTube viewers. Uh, it's on medium.com slash at Eric Gason. Uh, one of the articles is called The Theological Conquest of Money. That went pretty viral. And you wrote, you know, a bunch of other, I mean, you wrote a series of articles, amazing. The encrypted meaning of crypto, uh, the political theology of crypto. Now. Let me let me you know take a little bit of a different approach um, over here because you see um, as you might know you know my 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 show is about connecting the dots. I'm trying to break down the language, especially the technical economical barriers for the average person out there. Um, Eric, you know when when you observe the whole situation around, like uh, maybe you've heard in Iran now. I don't know. It was a commercial bank, yeah, a central yeah. bank. You know, in fire, they cut off the internet like uh, almost in instantaneously. It's like almost like to four percent, five percent from the normal level. I mean, if mm -hmm. something like that happens, and uh, something like you know satellite connection with local mesh network, you know everything that Blockstream doing, Go10 is doing is not really mature. Is not really made for mass mm -hmm. adoption or not really for adoption, critical adoption. Could you, maybe you, we can tie this all in, the, the essence of your articles, the knowledge, you know, the, the values, the ethos that you want to transport, to communicate. How would you sort of extrapolate this to this practical situation we have right now in Hong Kong, Iran, in so many other countries? What would you tell these people? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would tell them, first of all, that, uh, you know, thanks for struggling because what's going on is really crazy. And uh, when you really take a step back, like it, it's very insane. Like we've gotten to the place that we're in. You know, uh, I, I know that a lot of people are struggling. I'd say, look, first of all, is the, the Internet is obviously this new and extremely powerful piece of technology that we have. Um, and like, we're at this really critical stage where like, it's turning against us and it's turning against us pretty hard. And that's really scary. Uh, but at the very bottom, like we also have this new power of cryptography and like with it, even though, you know, like I'm not a mathematician, like I couldn't do any of these algorithms or formulas on my own, but because of the way they've been deployed, the way that the UX is utilized, like I can essentially mematically use. Uh, this piece of, you know, it was classified as a munition of war in conjunction with cryptography was fundamentally developed for the capacity of communicating under the duress of war. And I don't think it is by a mistake that we're here in 2019 and that crypto is starting to become a louder and more important conversation. And so for these people on the ground, I think uh, you guys really are on the front line, both physically and also technologically. And we're already seeing responses to that in this kind of escalation of brinkmanship in, in you know, all of these different social struggles. And I think Hong Kong is really showing the development of these tactics with the way that they're using lasers to scramble stuff, the way that they're deploying face masks and, and uh, cutting down surveillance towers. But it's still extremely immature, not well organized or thought out at this point. But I think we're at least starting to find uh, Essentially, like these are almost shilling points of dissatisfaction of where we can start to develop the capacity of really using cryptography in a way to not only organize ourselves, but start talking about alternative economic means, methodologies to be able to communicate uh, messages of dissent and so on. Mm -hmm. um, you wrote uh, in one of your articles, you wrote about Satoshi Nakamoto, you know, the, the best uh, sort of, I'm par paraphrasing this, some, uh, 
uh, as far as I remember, you wrote that you know the best service he, the way he showed his ethos or or the the best service. I don't let me let me let me, let me pull up that that quote from, from sure. yours. Um, it's somewhere at the end, I think, right? Um, where you write by by walking away from the machine of power that it created, Satoshi also closed the door of law from being able to come to our home of cyberspace while creating the opening for a totally new form of politics to be enacted. Through the sacrifice and choice to walk away, Satoshi enacted a machine of political power and glory that no amount of violence can destroy, no amount of tyranny can control. The value of Bitcoin is the creation of a new commonwealth of law governed by the open source code and the protocol which forms a kind of wealth beyond any state of government because of the cryptography at its core. Anyway, the, the, my listeners should, should definitely, I urge them to, to read the article. It's really not only eloquent, but really deeply philosophical, deeply essential for, for a comprehension of what, what's the meaning, what, what's the essence of Bitcoin? You know, why, why Bitcoin? Um, why, am I, why am I quoting this? Uh, I wanted to ask you, do you think uh, the whole, um, everything that is, that we are now learning through Bitcoin, each and every one of us, whether a newbie or a Bitcoin maximalist, a coder, cryptographers, the economists, everybody, do you think it is really literally teaching us, uh, you know, becoming a better human, being more ethical? Do you think that the whole structure of our civilization is, is, is fundamentally changing because of the structure, because of the, uh, what do you want to call it? Decentralized nature, because of the open source nature, uh, because of the you know uh, the the equality at its core. Um, um, do you think it's, it's something you know something is changing within us, uh, even even though gradually? Yeah, you know, I think uh, it it's hard to really fathom it because uh, you know h- how would people understand being in the middle of an epochal sort of change. But, you know, I think one of the things that's so important about why Bitcoin and not Ethereum or Monero or any other things is uh, Satoshi like took on this extremely Promethean effort in creating Bitcoin and like the, the painful labor that he went through, not only to deploy it in the world, but to think it out and to also protect his own identity. And that quote that you read, like, I think what's so important is that, you know, Satoshi is, for all intents and purposes, one of the wealthiest people on the planet. And at the same time, like, he hasn't even touched that fortune. And particularly in a world that's so lost to to the Hoover and Avars and greed of this world, like, I think that that is a profound statement. Like, the fact that he had the forward thinking to pay for the Bitcoin.org, you know, the, the namespace by mailing in cash like that's extraordinary and i think it goes to show that like he really understood uh what sort of power was here and maybe not the full extent to it but he definitely got and i think that that's one of the reasons that's so important is i think by keeping himself concealed he also kind of reveals this extraordinary machine of anonymity at its core that uh i remember even edward Snowden said this so that like What's so incredible is like he went up against the machine of power and like he was able to protect himself with using protocols of cryptography to protect his identity. And like that goes, that's like a real testing ground that goes to show, okay, like this stuff works. Now we need to start understanding how to use it. And I think Bitcoin by uh, its design, it's forcing an ontological conversation that's really developing now because people are like, well, why not ETH? Why not Monero? Why not? these other systems. And it's not to throw shade at them at all or to say that Bitcoin's the only way, but it's really presenting uh, the design choices that Satoshi made and the philosophy that say Blockstream has over other organizations and how it's all developing and evolving. And I think the most important thing is, is it's now clear that this is all here to stay. Uh, And as we were talking about a little earlier before we started recording that, uh, this is all developing and moving in a direction that uh, I think is really important because, uh, and it's also really funny because uh, in that quote that you had, uh, I'm making a reference to uh, Kafka's Before the Law. 
And I really like that allegory. Uh, and also like I consider myself a student of Giorgio Ambigens and he has a philosophical dialogue about that perhaps the man from the country, he, he's not actually trying to get access to the law. He's actually engaging in a strategy to get the authoritarian guard to close the door to law. And I actually think that's part of what's happening here. And I actually think as, uh, it's pretty clear to me that like, between the West and the East, there's almost like a Cold War 2.0 developing technologically. Uh, and the West can totally fuck this up and like become, you know, part of that system. But there is also the core ability at, at the center of this for people who are part of these systems to really understand it and go, whoa, wait a minute. We can deploy and uh, allow for what is at the heart of this technology and the way it honors privacy and, and financial independence to become part of this greater conversation of how we become a globalized civilization with this new component of law at its core. And so I, I actually fundamentally believe that like what Bitcoin and Satoshi did was he actually founded, I think you'd call it law, but, but it's, it's beyond law insofar that like it's no longer dealing with these questions of sovereignty, prohibition, and authority. It's actually creating a totally new and different strategy by the division between physicality and the protection that anonymity can give us by essentially creating this economic object that violence can no longer control. Right. Um, let me let me think. Uh, who had I this, had this discussion where I asked um, this uh, question about the anonymity pseudonymity? You know, uh, well, Bitcoin is pseudonymous, right? Mm -hmm. uh, now, without going to speculation, do you think, uh, I mean, just from the, from the, if you put yourself into the shoes of Satoshi Nakamoto at that time with his vision, you think he wanted it to be pseudonymous or did he, if it was in any way technologically feasible, would he have made it like from the ground up anonymous, <laughs> purely, you know, so, sort of totally secret, anonymous transaction? Do you think it was, or do you think it was just part of the plan that, you know, uh, I think it was part of the plan uh, of like fundamentally in order for this system to work, the pseudo anonymity had to, to be part of it. And I think that's why he, he himself was pseudo anonymous. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think there necessarily was the full intentionality because, you know, like the addresses weren't originally part of the design and, and there was this way to do it, these VIP. Uh, but I think the way that he kept himself pseudo anonymous, he understood that there was a real power and component to that but i don't think he necessarily needed that to be integrated into the design and framework but i think once he presented it the other individuals that were kind of more skillful at coding and building out the system could identify those components and expand it upon it got it yeah makes sense yeah um so eric i mean you know the the uh, i think we we haven't even understood I, I probably don't, haven't really understood the real power of Bitcoin. I mean, if people, a critical mass of people really comprehended what is possible, the potential of Bitcoin being adopted at a critical level, and I'm not talking about like billions of people, like a couple of hundred millions of people, uh, wouldn't it like totally, uh, what do you call what's the word, usurp or uh, undermine the fiat currencies, all fiat? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, like kind of at the far end of this, like I actually think it, it's, uh, I mean, it's a dramatic word, but like, I think it's apocalyptic. And like, and I don't mean that in like the end of the world, but like, uh, I do think it has the, the chance to fundamentally like end law as we understand it. And I'm, and that's not to like say that the law is this evil thing that we don't need anymore. But, uh, part of being a student of Ambigens, I fundamentally believe that what occurred between World War One and World War Two, like fundamentally shipwrecked the law. And that, you know, I think it's extremely important as a student of history, like there were genocides conducted all throughout the 20th century and that form of warfare and violence simply was not attainable unless you had the fiat economy developed in such a way that like you were literally stealing from people. Uh, and, and like at the back end, it's super crazy. Like when you realize that uh, the IMF's capital funding came from the American theft of gold from Executive Order 6102. 
you know, in conjunction with like Brenton Woods was founded upon this idea of bank or, but at the end of the day, Americans just double crossed everybody and said, fuck it, we'll give them the dollar. And so like, when you start to realize that like, there's this kind of crime that the state gets to commit once they give them right to seniorage, uh, like stuff starts to get really complicated and muddled. And I think that's why when we start to see how Bitcoin uh, sort of like reclaimed this capacity for commodity money to re-represent itself as what it's truly meant to be as a sovereign nation state thing. Uh, like I actually think like how this plays out internationally is essentially like nation states have to go back to like almost a mercantilist methodology in this highly advanced world. And like that's just going to become this mechanism that uh, essentially like forces power of the purse back onto the state. And I think it's one of the most important and radical economic solutions, particularly when you consider, you know, all of these insane, well, I don't want to call them insane, but like all of these desperate movements that people have against their government, like at the heart of it is, it's all about economics and the, and the ability for people to have the right to life, you know? Um, I'm, I'm, I can't remember if it was in Iran. Was it in Iran that the, the, this all sparked off because of a 50% fuel hike? Yeah. Yeah, amongst yeah, them. and like yeah. you know, and like they're one of the largest producers of fuel in the world, and I think one of the most interesting and important components of this conversation is it's not just about that right to economic life that's lost, but it's the fundamental insult that they can do that to people, that they can just radically make this decision that can fuck up people's lives in such a severe way, and people are mad and they don't feel like there's any way to take back power, and I think for me discovering Bitcoin at the back end of the Occupy movement, I felt so disenfranchised and that, uh, you know, like the, the radical ideas that people wanted to achieve were totally impossible. Um, you know, and I, I had my own fall from liberalism after this, but when I discovered Bitcoin, what was so important to me was that I could individually make a choice to exit from the system. And, you know, a lot of people warned me at the time, they're like, this is risky, it's crazy, it'll collapse, it's a bubble. Um, but it was great because my partner was like, no, like, F that noise. She was like, if you don't, if you don't do this and you know, the price does double, uh, you're really going to regret it. If the price collapses, she'll like, you can pay the money back. Who cares? Um, and for me, like that was part of the development of this faith in the system of realizing the faith in the system of Bitcoin and, and essentially my de faith in the actual fiat system. And that, uh, I feel safer with my money in Bitcoin. You know, like I, I have my stuff in, in a three of five keys and you know, it, it would be really fascinating to see if somebody could could get all my Bitcoin from me. Um, and so I think that this radical new power to protect one's wealth is really important. Um, I traveled a lot when I was younger. And one of the things that really stuck with me is I, I watched this Burmese woman get shook down for all the money that she had at her general store. And there wasn't anything she could do about that. You know, and so uh, while we're still at the very beginning of all of this, I see a lot of really radical hope. And I think like, we're just starting to see people get faith in it. You know, like I, I really wonder about what happens when, uh, you know, my son becomes an adult and Bitcoin's lasted for longer than him. And I've been telling him about it his whole life, including, you know, there's a whole generation of people out there that I know that this same conversation is happening with their own children. And I think it's really important because this is all building towards this new foundational idea that uh, I honestly don't know what it looks like, but it's clear that it is revolutionary, it is extremely powerful, and that uh, new relationships are being forged and created through this. And I have a deep faith, uh, maybe even almost a pathological faith, that this is going to help save the planet from a lot of the woes that we see today. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, Dev, I'm totally on the same page with you, um, Eric. And, and you know, the most thrilling, I'm going to come to that, you know, that, that real essential question, which I always love to ask, because it's so fundamentally important in understanding, you know, the, the future of Bitcoin. Um, you know, I mean, my hope is that really, uh, because of the decentralized nature of Bitcoin, the, the you know, the, the, the power that it exerts, is that all these political, religious, uh, you know, nation states, borders, they all become obsolete. I mean, you know, that's one thing. And then the other thing is that, you know, I think we have lost at least a hundred years of civilizationary evolution. 
uh, in scientific and technological terms. Whatever, you know, we don't want to go into stories like about, you know, suppression, seizing, supp uh, you know, but that's, I think, the most uh, thrilling uh, vision for me is to, like, already having a monetary root laying of Bitcoin where we don't talk about Bitcoin anymore, we just live it, and the ecosystems and the structures that are built upon it are so vast, are so unimaginable, I think, for most people right now, that it, yeah, the, the question is how fast is it going to evolve? Do you have any, like, do you have any thoughts, perspective on that? Uh, I have a good friend who, who we like to, to hang out and speculate about this stuff. He, he's a, a security engineer at Coinbase, and that's where we met. And it's funny because he pointed out, he was like, look, it's already developing extremely fast. Like, considering that this thing is just 10 years old and like it's already huge it's spawned this entire industry uh but i also think like being in the middle of it we're like 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 when's it gonna happen come on and i think the truth is is that like uh i think it's pretty far away just because like there it's a huge planet and there's tons of stuff going on but at the same time you know like uh there's a real possibility for there to be like a global awakening and for uh because like it's clear that you know in our conversation like we both kind of had the same sort of zealotry about this and like that's special like that doesn't exist in a lot of places you know like people people don't make it like a, an ethical premise for like why they need to like talk about like why their money's so good and like that's part of the real equation here is i think the truth is is that what bitcoin is is that it is this radical uh, and when I use this word radical, I'm, I mean, it in a sense of that, like, it can't be corroborated and incorporated into the government. Uh, and so through this radical feature, it really puts political power back into the hands of people in a way that they've never had before, you know, and uh, I like to read a lot of historic literature. And I find it so fascinating that uh, when people were originally resisting industrialization, like, they were totally cool with property destruction and like blocking people's lines and stuff. And like, whether you agree with that or not, it's more about in the contemporary situation, we've been so, uh, what's the word I want? I guess like vaccinated against the idea of radical resistance that like, I don't even think tactically it's even possible to achieve a revolution without technology. Um, and so I think like as the conversation plays out more and more, I think we're really gonna discover like, this is actually about our rights and values as people, the methodology that we use to create uh, how we achieve those rights and i think because of what crypto is it does it in this super radical way that essentially says look like a right is something that we're going to insist upon and create through this technological means as opposed to being something that we request from authoritarian figure to protect us with and being a student of ambigans like that's one of the things that i see in the contemporary world that's so dangerous is that uh you know, in the United States, we just renewed the Patriot Act for three months, a, a horrific bill that represents everything that, that is uh, this individual that Ambigan focuses a lot of effort on called homo sacer. It means this, the forsaken man in Latin. And it's a reference to this individual that can essentially be uh, branded as an outlaw so that anybody can kill them, but they cannot be sacrificed. And the way that that plays out in contemporary America is that anybody can be labeled as an enemy combatant and then deprived of the law. And the very truth is today, like, we actually don't know how many Americans have been put in uh, the sort of protective custody because of being labeled as an enemy combatant. And so uh, I think part of it is, is that the, the laws we understand has fundamentally broken itself, and this is a way to reclaim it. Yeah, yeah, this is crazy if you think about it. Yeah, this is... Oh, yeah, it's so bananas. Like, I, I never... I never expected any of this shit to go on, you know? And like the fact that like I was kind of crazy enough to like see it all early on was really fun. Cause I was like, all right, like here we are. Like other people showed up at Coinbase and I'm like, hi, you're crazy too. And they're like, yeah. And that was the best part is like, this all acted as a shilling point for a bunch of radical people that wanted to get together and change the world. And now we're like five years in front of that. <laughs> this is so insane. So okay, so there. Uh, let, let's go to the basic uh, stuff. Like why? Why Bitcoin? So okay, there's uh, you know there's needs, desires, wishes. There's you know oppression, coercion, aggression, inflation, hyperinflation. Right. So right. Yeah, yeah. It goes on and on. On that. The other side, as I always say, is that. 
people, I think, have a hard time because of this indoctrination, you know, starting in school. You know, it's, it's not even our parents' fault or our teachers' fault. They learned the same bullshit and they got, you know, tr passed on the, the same indoctrinated bullshit. So uh, it's really, cr so I'm, what I'm trying to say is that if it was just possible to visualize, like, this is the life we could have in 10, 20 years time. Like, you know, you could, you'd have to work less, you know, you, you, you could just do things out of your passion, you know, contribute back to society, whatever it is, art, science, technology, you know, education, um, whatever it is, you know, like a totally different civilization. We could have technologies, you know, coming to the surface, uh, you know, maybe even for the first time after decades or even a, a century and, and really serving humanity and, and, you know, we could have a totally new, so maybe this is, this is, this could be a motivator. Maybe this could be an inspirator for many other people, maybe for a group of people, you know, who. Absolutely. And I think uh, one of the things that I think that are most fascinating is actually like, because of its methodology of development, like, uh, you know, in 2011, for pretty much Bitcoin was exclusively crypto anarchists and libertarians. And uh, while the vast majority hold uh, decided to, to sell or whatever, there was a class of people that were made very wealthy that are now out in the ecosystem investing and developing. And I think it's really important to realize and understand that like that original class that got very wealthy off of Bitcoin, uh, some made extremely stupid choices like Roger Ver and others, uh, and others want to play pedantic Lambo games about look at me, I make all of this money and I'm super cool, look at me, look at me. Uh, and like, it's all just like kind of a bullshit virtue signaling game, but at the very bottom of it, there are people, uh, like the pineapple fund, this new anonymous fund that just got announced. Uh, like it's really exciting because this class of people who are never supposed to make a shitload of money off of their ideological perspectives did. And now they're able to take that capital and reinvest it in the ecosystem. Or even more importantly, they just hold it. And because of that, that allows for the general solidarity for, you know, the system to work as it was intended. And I think, uh, in all honesty, like, I think the truly revolutionary aspect is going to come uh, from, like, the next generation. From, like, people who were children when Bitcoin was deployed. And because uh, I think, like, they, they almost need to have had... Uh, this sort of counter dialogue that we've all started developing over the last decade. Uh, you know, and so like, I know my son's going to go to school and he's going to be, he'll learn, but at the same time, he'll always have a questioning at the back of his mind. You know, like he'll engage in, uh, you know, shit, it's everywhere in society, but he'll be able to have that extra bit of knowledge behind him. And I think like that's going to develop into, and we're already seeing it with these movements. Like uh, people are fucking angry. And they have a right to be angry. I mean, like, in the United States, like, look at this Epstein bullshit. Like, it's extraordinary. And that they're like, you know, and just all of the excuses about everything. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, people realize that, like, this system isn't working. And there are other answers. We've now solved this economically. And now we need to tie it directly into the political. Um, and I'm not sure how that's produced, you know, like I, I don't, I'm an anarchist. I don't believe in uh, liberal party politics. I think it's really dangerous. Uh, but at the same time, like, I don't know, I, I wax with friends. I'm like, I should just start like a fascist Bitcoin movement and just force it. But no, that would be dangerous and, and terrible. Um, but at the same time, like there is a danger of somebody trying to cooperate the movement and do that. And I actually think like that's sort of what, uh, Bitcoin Satoshi vision and fucking that insane asshole Craig Wright sort of represented is that like, uh, like this is really powerful technology and it's dangerous. And like if, we're, if we're not careful about how we involve ourselves in it, it could like, it can go south really bad, you know? And something I've been thinking more about is, uh, you know, Ethereum is an interesting project. It's cool. I like the way that it's making developments and changes. But I really worry about all of how the developers are actually known. Uh, you know, like I worry about Vitalik's history with a Chinese investment firm. Uh, you know, like there, there are these problems that uh, like as things escalate, I'm really worried about the way that like, you know, can, can like regulators just like, or not regulators, but like could, could various people who are known in the system be abducted, pressured out of their coins, pressured into making systemic changes that wouldn't be good for the environment. 
Um, and I think that kind of adversarial thinking that seems to be much more core to Bitcoin uh, is, is, is really going to pay off more fruitfully uh, in the long term, just because like, I think this is something really, really dangerous, and I don't think states understand that yet. And I think when they do understand it, it's going to, uh, to me, like, I actually think like, that's the apocalyptic moment where like, the state unveils itself as the Keqiyan and the Antichrist, and it essentially is like, no one has any more rights. We're in a permanent state of emergency. We can spy on anything and anyone for any reason. This is so insane. Uh, so, it is, it is. Eric, um, now, what, what do what do you where, do you see? What, what's the challenges you think ahead of us? I mean, if if it were up to you, what would you? How would you proceed? I mean, uh, would, I mean, give, let me give one example. It would look like like really practical as I as we discussed you know, in the beginning with Iran and you know like internet breaking down. Uh, the only possible way is to, you know, transact or even send messages is like, you know, via antenna, you know, a local mesh network, satellite connection, and totally free and decentralized and, and totally censorship resistant. We need something like that, but really on a mass scale. Uh, where do you see uh, other challenges? I don't know. I mean, I actually think one of the biggest challenges is, uh, you know, a lot of this deeper stuff we're talking about. Like people really need to understand that there's a much deeper philosophical praxis that's occurring here. And I think that, uh, I don't think that that's a bad thing that it hasn't developed that way so far. Cause I actually think like the amount of noise that's been going on has been really essential to essentially like act as a cover for, you know, like the development of ZK snarks. Like that's super important in the grand development of things. And I think if you had a really focused governmental eye looking at that, as opposed to like, you know, 10,000 shitcoin projects, I'm not, I'm not sure if that same sort of development could have been done. Uh, in addition to like, I think a lot of it is uh, like people who are already pretty hardcore and committed to this, like doubling down into that. Um, you know, like I, I'm hesitant about the idea of an actual like political party or something like that, but, but I am pretty interested in the idea of like a, an anarcho syndicalist union of some sort, you know, where people essentially like, I think one of the biggest and most important ones is people actually saying, Hey, like, you know, I use Bitcoin. I like crypto. I accept it. And I think starting to build a circular economy, you know, uh, I'm a farmer. I grow tomatoes and vegetables and also cannabis because we're in California. Uh, and like, you know, I sell that to, to people for crypto and uh, it's not much, you know, it's just much more of a fun exchange that I have with friends and people. But I think it's an important methodology of supporting. And I think the other one is, is in the West, like most of us don't know or understand inflation in the same way as the global South. And I think uh, like that's a conversation that can't be avoided for much longer. Uh, but with that being said, I would say the greatest barrier to, to seeing kind of this radical world be created is people's own limitations. You know, like it's, um, I had close friends who like watched me kind of, uh, you know, go off the deep end with crypto back in 2012 and like take out loans and stuff in it and, you know, and, like really invest heavily in it. And uh, they were like, this is a terrible idea. And I was like, no, it's not. And like, you know, I, I did well enough that I didn't blow it all up in my face as I should have. But I remember as it developed more and more, like they, um, I don't want to say that they became jaded about it, but uh, it was almost like too unbelievable for them. Uh, and they, and like that, it really almost closed down conversation in a way that, um, I, I don't know, it scared me because like it, it wasn't so much about the logic of what was happening as much as it was like the commitment to their own political causes. And I find that that's happening on a more meta level right now with like uh, general status and the economic conversations about Bitcoin. You know, like Paul Krugman a number of times has just been like, oh, duh, it's a waste of money and nobody knows how it works and it's a bubble. Instead of starting to be like, why is this working? You know, and I think that that, um, that sort of intellectual sincerity needs to be desired from people. And I'm not totally clear about how to cultivate that. Right. By the way, you mentioned cannabis. The, uh, the bill has been just introduced uh, recently to decriminalize or legalize cannabis federally on a federal level. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm skeptical. I, 
just seeing how much they fucked up here in California and other places, like it's clear that like this is a cash grab, just like everything fucking else in the world. Uh, and it's sad, just you know, uh, where I grew up, a lot of people grew cannabis kind of as a secondary endeavor and a cash crop, and that's really been wrecked through the industrialization of it. And like, that's just kind of the process that we're so used to, you know. And like, that's the same thing with uh, you know, fucking stable coins and shit now. Like Bitcoin was successful here, so everybody else had to come out and try to stake a claim on it. Yeah, now the reason I'm asking is because, uh, uh, you know, after Canada now, you know, fully legalized it, um, the pressure is going to mount up. I think, uh, you know, oh, yeah. the, the pressure is going to come because eventually, I mean, I'm totally for decriminalization and eventual legalization of, of cannabis because of, you know, of medical properties, you know, uh, uh, THC, CBD oils and stuff like that. I mean, so many patients and people, uh, you know, uh, desiring this as an alternative you know legitimately uh, you know alternative healing uh medicine so i hope this is gonna you know swap over to european union to austria and you know finally for sure i mean it, it you know? it's a great way for for countries to generate money through taxation when they want to uh not that i necessarily fully agree with that but it's a much better world than the current one uh, in addition to, to be honest with you, like I actually think part of why decriminalization started to occur in the United States, I mean, it was already rolling, but the reason it went full is uh, I very sincerely believe that the darknet markets have, have really propelled and changed the conversation about drugs. Uh, and I think uh, cannabis legalization was part of that, but I also think the renewed conversation about psychedelics, uh, like I very strongly feel like what happened with the Silk Road early on because I mean, like one of the things we don't talk about in crypto, because it's such a seditious conversation, is that uh, like global drug markets are like the fourth largest market in the world, and like Ross Ulbricht single fucking handedly created this brilliant market that allowed for people to freely exchange, reduce friction, and most importantly, like a pretty much abrogated violence around the entire problem, and like that's extraordinary. And yeah, I think part yeah, of that is peer to peer to peer, whatever drug. I mean, <laughs> yeah. And, and what's so important is not only was it freely deploying the, you know, what people do with their own bodies, their own business, I don't care, but more important, it goes to show that even though governments were totally against it and wanted to stop it, they didn't have a capacity for it. And I think that that's extremely important, both on the side, on both sides of one is people got access to these drugs in a much more efficient way that had people, uh, you know, tested and all this stuff. And then the way that those drugs literally affected them and had them start remapping of, hey, like, why is this still legal? Why is this happening? And I think like that's kind of uh, at like the base of a lot of kind of the, the counterculture that's in crypto is, uh, you know, like I'm pretty plugged in. I've, I've been in the space for about seven years now. I'm like, uh, people are pretty weird. And like they're down with experimenting and uh, they... And, and, you know, like it's a minority, but but there's still much more than the general populace, people real curious and experimental, uh, and they really want to take claim back over uh, their lives. And I mean, like to me, like drug use is fundamentally about privacy, you know, like what somebody chooses to do with their body is their own business. And I just don't see uh, how I have any right to stop people to the, towards that. In addition to the way that, like, uh, you know, there, there's been a lot of studies now that show, like, these are pretty valuable substances. So, you know, I think uh, it's pretty cool to see the way that this is all working together and changing stuff. And so I feel really excited and hopeful about the future in a way that uh, would have been totally unachievable without Bitcoin and the achievement that's made over the last seven years. Exactly, yeah, and let's not forget, you know, the whole double and triple morality hypocrisy of, of you know, uh, billions and trillions being laundered through banks and uh, the CIA importing, you know, uh, flooding yeah, the the, blood, and... the black uh, neighborhoods with with coke, you know, you know, all these investigative cover up uh, stories. So it's uh, just the tip of the iceberg, but uh, we shouldn't never forget it's uh, it's artificially created this kind of situ situations, and then. But they, you know, allege us, allege the whole, I mean, it's crazy. This is so insane. <laughs> it's like. It is. Like, we're, we're like, we are <laughs> long past bananas land. And like, we're, and like, that's why like, none of this shit even surprises me anymore. That like, things are just so fucking wacky and detethered from 
You know, it's funny. Actually, I met Neil Stevenson, uh, the, the author of Fall and Snow Crash and Cryptonomicon a couple weeks ago. Uh, and I got to ask him a question. I was like, what are you like? What really freaks you out about the future? Like 10 years from now, like what do you think's really going to keep you awake at night? And he was like, I think we're going into a post-truth society. He was like, I think we're already seeing components of it. But he was like, we can just have like a total clean break with the truth. And he was like, we forget that like, there was a society that we came from and lived in for millennia, that that's how things worked. And he was like, we can totally go back to it. And that's my greatest fear is, is uh, you know, like we belong to the special generation of people that like we remember before the internet and we grew up with it and learned how to make it a technique of power that we can harness for ourselves. Uh, you know, I think about, uh, my father-in-law or my grandmother are these people who, who don't understand, like they're totally captured in it in a way that is super dangerous. Like they, I mean, particularly here in the United States with the older crowd, uh, like conversations gotten to a very critical and dangerous level of where, uh, like I throw people for a loop because they can't find me on the political spectrum, but they always want to try to like shove me into being like a leftist or a rightist. And I'm like, I'm not on the, pers I'm not on the spectrum like that. And it really f kind of glitches them out and freaks them out. And so uh, I think we're at this very critical place where, uh, and like the other one is like, if we didn't have crypto right now, like shit would be super fucking dark. And like, I find it, uh, like it seems to be beyond serendipitous to me that like Bitcoin just showed up like at this very critical time. It's like, oh, hey, like, did your government just bail out huge banks because of their complete shitty and immature behavior with like how they're trying to make a housing crisis like not happen? Check it out. Here's this new money. It's like, whoa, what the fuck? Uh, you know, and like the other truth is, is like we haven't seen a global catastrophe like 2008 since Bitcoin's been produced. And the idea of a Minsky moment seems really radical. This idea where like the whole market falls out from underneath itself. But at the same time, like, when you draw the logical conclusions, it seems to, you know, in the same way, that, like, I remember earlier at Coinbase, we'd like hang out together and we'd be like, could you imagine like a thousand dollar Bitcoin? Like, oh my God, like, we'd be on the moon. And, and like, we're totally past that now. Like, we're just some weird banana, you know, like as crazy as everything's going on in contemporary reality, you know, with like the American government conducting war across half the planet and all this other crazy shit. It's just as crazy on the inverse side that, like, we actually have a magical internet money that protects us that, like, no governments can seize. And, and, like, they don't even get that yet. Like, they're still just kind of trying to figure out what's going on. It's crazy. So where do you go from here, Eric? What's, what, are, what do you think are the next years going to bring us in terms of price stock to uh, do, do you know anything about the stock to flow ratio what, what do you think about the stock to flow ratio <laughs> i think the stock to flow ratio is an interesting model um funny enough like i kind of developed my own economic theory early on about uh let's see if i can frame this up pretty quickly um well essentially like i think you know bitcoin is deflationary i think essentially it is uh, minted from like electrical energy itself i think bitcoin functions as an actual energy sink uh i think when the we start to go into bubble territory the price enters into something called dynamic disequilibrium it was a theory of george soros's uh and vis-a-vis -vis dynamic disequilibrium the price totally detethers itself from uh, wherever it was before and then essentially through monetary velocity of people exchanging uh, that ends up becoming this new equilibrium thing that rebalances itself out. And that essentially the bubble cycle is part of the entire development of speculation on the energy supply that like essentially acts as a, a, a free mode bearing interest for whoever is making the choice to invest at that point in time and period. So I think, uh, I think we're probably going to see a lot of sideways price action for, uh, I think it's going to happen up to the happening. Like, I think there'll probably be, we might go back up to around 10 K, but I think we'll hang out there and tell the happening. And then I think probably about a month or two after the happening, we'll start to, to go back into another bubble cycle. Um, I mean, it's really crazy. Cause like the, the numbers correlate to like the next bubble should be like a hundred thousand dollars a coin or some shit, but like that, I don't know, like that's fucking crazy. But again, like Bitcoin ever getting to $19,000 fucking crazy too. So like, I don't even know what to say at this point in time. You know, in addition to 
earlier you were talking about like some of the other components. I think uh, one of the most important ones is, is as people gain more time and experience in this field, like you, you start to roll with the punches. Like you, uh, like it's not a big deal to me that uh, like my net worth can fluctuate as much as the price of Bitcoin daily because I also know that I see the upside to that. And I think being able to have the faith and wherewithal to truly understand what's happening and not just shit your pants and sell all your Bitcoin, which, you know, I think that's also a rite of passage. I think we all have to shit our pants and sell a lot of Bitcoin at some point in time. Exactly. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, I do see in, a, in the next few years uh, more and more, even maybe, maybe even like in a low profile uh, level, more you know like ultra net worth uh people ultra what do you call them ultra net rich people family offices pension funds endowment funds you know uh, uh, uh putting more and more money uh, into bitcoin uh maybe not obviously conspicuously but you know yeah i mean like their their hands being forced you know like i i find it really amazing that uh like in america of all places like we're having these conversations about like yo do we just like rob these rich guys and it's like like look like i totally understand you guys want to redistribute wealth but like the the way that the conversation is going on is really dangerous because like i think pretty much anybody who is a powerful entrepreneur is kind of looking at the situation out being like uh I don't know. Um, and I think that that's really dangerous because like as, I mean, like a great example is the enforcement mechanisms that's going on with crypto right now. Like in the state of California, I'm going to pay the state of California an extra, I think it's like 13% on top of what I pay the federal government just for cashing out crypto. Uh, you know, and like that's a lot of money. So I would, you know, whereas the state next door that I love to visit and I, I spend time there is Nevada. They have zero capital gains taxes. I'm going to move to Nevada. I know other people in crypto that have chose to move states as well. Uh, and I think like this is the kind of brain drain that we're going to actually see is, uh, you know, my wife and I, we spent, I did some skiing in Andorra a couple of years ago. They have some super friendly legislation both there and in Spain and Portugal. I think naturally what's going to end up happening is uh, wealthy entrepreneurs who are in crypto are going to naturally gravitate towards uh, states and countries that will be friendly to them. And I think one of the most important ones is, is I'm not doing this because I want to avoid taxes. I'm doing this because like I want strong legislation and property protection. And like right now I'm in this like weird fucking gray area where like the, you know, all of these three lettered agencies are like, are you a criminal? Are you not a criminal? Like tell us everything that you have ever done online and we'll fight, figure this out for you. You know, it's fucking crazy. And so I, I think that uh, that is going to be an important development. And that's also part of the, the general prisoner's dilemma that Bitcoin like forces nation states into. Right. I think it was just recently I read a report. I don't know, but I think there was a number of uh, IRS, eight ex-IRS agents testifying in some kind of hearings that the income tax is actually a voluntary tax or something <laughs> oh i saw it is unconstitutional earlier, come on stupid. yeah it is unconstitutional it is, isn't it well it's funny because we didn't even have an income tax until uh i think it was 1917 you know i'm like that that i think it's so funny that like if you look at american history and like really read it deeply like so much of it was about the control and power of money. I mean, like from the very foundation of the American Constitution, the debates between Thomas Jefferson and, and Alexander Hamilton to Andrew Jackson's fight against the Second Bank of the United States to uh, the free wildcat banking era that, era that happened from, you know, the early or the early 1800s all the way to the Civil War. And like, at, at, and the other one that's fascinating is each and every step of the monetary system being taken control it was precipitated by a state of emergency being declared that would then utilize to be capturing them. And to me, like, again, that's kind of why this is about the failure of laws, because like the constitution in the United States is extremely clear that the federal government is not supposed to be involved with monetary issuance or creation. And yet they do all this fuckery to get around it. And, and I think the thing that's even funnier is that like this fuckery has happened like so many times like, we're just, like, totally removed from anything at this point in time. The dollar has no fucking meaning beyond the debt that we're all enslaved to, yada, yada, yada. Um, and so, like, I think it's really fascinating that, uh, like, this, 
this is epochal in terms of we haven't seen anything like this produced in the world for at least a century, you know, in, in addition to shit, I think some of the last countries that like went off the gold standard was like in the late sixties. So we haven't even seen a commodity money tethered to any kind of logical outcome in, you know, at least 50 years. Wow. Um, all right. Uh, well, Eric, um, I don't have any questions. And uh, yeah, I mean, I do have a lot of questions. But I, wanna, <laughs> I don't want to overwhelm my, my listeners. Uh, it's an hour. Do you have like any closing remarks or thoughts? Or uh, I mean, I'm going to put your uh, Twitter handle and your Medium uh, articles on. Anything? Uh, yeah, if anybody has feedback for me or if there's uh, other writing that you would like to see, please let me know. In addition to uh, thanks for being curious and thanks for listening. And, uh, and Kayvon, thanks for p producing this and asking these uh, fascinating questions. I think that this is the direction we're going. And uh, yeah, it's really exciting. And I hope that anybody who's out there who you know is uh not totally sold on it like tweet at us like let us know like we we're fascinated with this and want to you know i'm evangelical about it i literally want to convert people and share the good news of bitcoin with them so uh so yeah thanks for having me on this was a lot of fun i really appreciate it yeah final question do you think uh like has mccook always says or He's now starting preaching in his orange wardrobe. I don't know what, it's so funny. It's sort of a religion now. It's become a religion. I mean, I, I'm not a fan of religion, but it's like the ritual probably of, I mean, it's more on a scientific, more comp, you know, comprehension level, everything. And it's more logical. Well, I, think, logical. I think cryptography at its core is fundamentally logical. And like, and I think uh, the, the avant-garde performance and play in it is really important because uh, I like that it's inflammatory. I also like that it is opening up these questions to people. In addition to, I mean, hey, the truth is, is that like, maybe there is something very real there. Like maybe a hundred years from now, like people will look back to the blockchain and be like, these were when the first prayers were embedded to the blockchain. And, <laughs> right. You know, like I, I can't make a call about it. Like I'm pretty sure if like we were hanging out in the year, you know, 32 AD, we'd be like, did you hear about that crazy Jew that they, they crucified? He was, he was like the second, the son of God or some crap. And we'd all like laugh about it. But meanwhile, there was like this insane core group that would like later turn out to change the entire world. So, uh, in all honesty, like, I would not be super surprised if in the future people made a real religion around cryptography and Bitcoin because uh, it seems to be the only object on the known planet that seems to fulfill its oath to what it says it's going to do. Because I don't see any more than the 18 million Bitcoin that's currently out there. So, Right. So yeah, stay humble or who says that Matt Odell or Marty Band, uh, stack sets for salvation says has me. I love these memes. So yeah. And you know, uh, I think we should do this really for human evolution. I mean, this, uh, I see, I see, I really, I'm, I've never been so optimistic in my life than with Bitcoin. Seriously. Yeah, me too. Like I, and I'm a pessimistic motherfucker too. Like I, <laughs> I mean, like, read some of my essays. Like, this yeah. shit is dark. You know, like, I'm talking about how we all live in giant open-air yeah. prison camps. Like, Especially the drawings is like, ooh, that's like... Oh, really yeah, I, I love getting these fucked up drawings from, from history. Um, but, yeah, you know, like, it, it, it's, it's really radical because in a world that has completely lost any sort of ethical meaning beyond yeah. make more fucking money, yeah. it feels really good to be... And that's the funniest part is, is, like, it is about money, but it's actually about the ethical praxis of money, not its not the base value. Eric, I really enjoyed our talk. Hope to talk to you soon, maybe in a, maybe in a panel discussion. I'm, I, yeah, I, man, I, I would love that. And uh, yeah, solidarity with the cause. And uh, this is fun. Like the more I've been putting myself out there, I've been making contact with people like you and uh, there's lots of really good stuff going on and it's really exciting. Yeah, because each one of us, each one of you, you know, brings a totally different perspective and inspiration into this. And people, you know, different people need different, uh, you know, angles or perspectives or inspirations and, and, you know, like understanding the question from different facets of this, you know, diamond, uh, um, is, is really, uh, uh, yeah, it's like, uh, totally essential and, and, and necessary in these times, you know, where people already have such a short attention span. So, <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> Eric, thank you so much and talk to you soon. All right. Thank you. Be well, take care. Bye-bye. Well. Take care. Thank you. Welcome to the podcast show by Kevin Davani.
the total connector, total Bitcoin, Austrian economics, the hardest and scarcest money ever created in human history, Bitcoin.